it's an internship at a company here in Saudi Arabia. And that kind of, uh, I guess, ignited my love for the technology. And ever since then, all the work that I've been doing outside of classes has been somehow blockchain related. So to start off, let's just, uh, I'll just walk you through the agenda for today. So first we're gonna be talking about some of the problems that uh, were faced in various different industries, mostly the financial, um, before the introduction of blockchain technology. From there, we're going to be moving on to the general structure of blockchain and how it, uh, you can kind of look at it from a technical perspective. Then we're going to be talking about these things called smart contracts, um, which allow you to use blockchain in various different industries. And we'll give a few examples of that. Then I'll be talking about blockchain at PSU for a little bit and just kind of um, if like if I've interested you enough after this presentation, how you can kind of get involved with us and uh, the different things that we offer throughout the semester. And finally, if we have time, we can kind of look super briefly at a practical example of blockchain in action. Uh, also, feel free at any time to just drop a question here and there. Um, I know some of these concepts can kind of get confusing and I honestly don't mind, like it's better if we kind of address any of your concerns or questions at that particular step. So just don't be sad. Okay, so pre-blockchain problems. Why is blockchain needed in the first place? So before the implementation of blockchain, um, there was a problem called double spending. Now, what exactly does that mean? So basically whenever you use a digital currency, whether one that's blockchain oriented or not, there's always the risk of having that of having a specific piece of currency double spent. What that basically means is, let's say I have uh, $5 in my bank account. So double spending here would be if I used that exact same $5 amount on two various different products. So kind of, if I used it on one, uh, it shouldn't be my bank account anymore. Uh, it should have been depleted. However, somehow by through um, hacking or through different fraudulent techniques with different currencies online, there's always the risk of having that same amount of money spent somewhere else. And this has a lot of various problems, which mean, the most notable one, as you can see, is that users tend to, can then be allowed to spend money that they don't have, or people can, people's accounts can get hacked. They can be then accused of uh, financial fraud and all that other stuff. So that was one of the main problems. Uh, we don't really see it with um, cash or with a bunch of like, I guess the different services we use today, such as like um, any of your normal banks, but with the implementation of online currencies and not all of them are blockchain oriented, this problem was really apparent. Okay, the next thing we have is pretty common in today's world and uh, pretty much any system you can think of, any industry or any organization, um, including like Penn State as a university, uses some form of a centralized system. So what a centralized system basically means is that, um, let's say, let's take an example of banks. For, so let's say you and your friend um, both have, or want to transfer money to each other. So what you would need to do is you can't transfer the money directly amongst one another, unless it's cash, of course. But what would you need to do is you would kind of need to go to a trusted third party, or in this system, the bank. And the bank's job in this example is to kind of make sure that all of your credentials, so you and your friends check out, and to kind of facilitate the financial transfer between you two. So what this means is that in the system, you and your friend are both completely dependent on the bank. So let's say if the bank system shut down, um, because it's the only entity that kind of manages all these finances for you, if the bank shuts down, you have no other backup. It was kind of the main node the uh, thing that kind of tied everything together, which hence the term centralized, as you can see in the photo below. So the circle in the middle would kind of be the bank in this example, while all the other circles around it would be individuals. So anything you'd want to do, the bank needs to kind of uh, facilitate that transaction. And this has a lot of problems. Uh, like we said, if anything happens to the bank, then everything kind of um, shuts down. And the transactions are slow. Secondly, because by the time, so when you want to transfer money, the bank needs to check your credentials, needs to make sure everything checks out, and then it needs to kind of continue the transaction, also check the receiver if their credentials check out. And that is, although we think of it as something that happens super quickly these days, um, if we kind of really look at it in a detailed manner, we can see that it does take a lot of time and it can be much quicker. And the final problem, which is kind of a hot topic these days, is that this third party stores your information. 
So in order to kind of make sure that everything you input is legit, this party has to store some of your information to kind of compare it. And there's a whole bunch of uh, issues with that, including data privacy being the most apparent. Next, there's data tampering. And uh, we might not think of this as an immediate problem, but it does happen in various different industries. So basically what I mean is, uh, let's say uh, you're using an app, for example, and you've kind of uh, sent some messages to this app, uh, you've done a bunch of uh, different communication through it and all of that other stuff. You've inputted some information, maybe your social security number. So any user, whether you can consider it, um, let's say an employee of this company, so maybe it could be like an inside job. What if uh, a hacker came, um, like a third party, like a hacker uh, would kind of come and uh, be able to change that information. And although we have a bunch of different cybersecurity um, measures in place to counteract that today, um, we still see a bunch of different examples where companies have been compromised, data has been accessed. And um, if that happened to you, you might have gotten an email from said company saying, hey, uh, check out your account. Uh, we've recently um, undergone uh, a kind of data compromise or data breach. So just kind of make sure everything's okay. And this does happen. And if you go on various different websites, it'll kind of show you that a bunch of different companies and you might not even know what happens, experience this thing um, and it happens like every single day. And there are a bunch of problems. Number one is data integrity. So can we trust the data that we have in our system, the data that we've stored up until today? Um, individuals can delete traces of money laundering and that can happen in uh, big corporations. And overall data of different users can be tampered with for just one individual's gain. So we have all these different problems, double spending, uh, faulty transactions, centralized data storage, data tampering, and many others. And kind of as a solution to that, blockchain was introduced. And more specifically, it was Bitcoin. And we can think of Bitcoin as the first real implementation of blockchain technology. It's where it all started. And Bitcoin kind of aimed to solve the financial aspect of all the issues that I mentioned before. So although uh, a lot of us talk about Bitcoin all the time, whenever we think about blockchain, I want to look at the structure of a blockchain um, from a more kind of uh, zoomed out view. Uh, so I want to make it more generalized. So if there are all the structure that I'm like, all the structural components that I'll be talking about, I want you to uh, kind of untie that from Bitcoin just for a little bit and kind of look at the big picture. And of course, I'll be talking about how Bitcoin solved all these issues. So number one, the most important feature of a blockchain, the thing that makes it most notable is the fact that it's a distributed system. So we talked about centralized systems before. So here what a distributed system is exactly the opposite. So every single node, every single entity in the system that we have or in the network, we could call it is connected to each other. So um, in the case of Bitcoin, let's say you and your friend um, want to one of you, you want to transfer money to your friend, same example. What would happen is in this case, there isn't any third party, there's just software. And what that does is this software, which we call Bitcoin, kind of just immediately takes your money and directly transfers it to your friend. There's no person in the middle kind of, um, there's no uh, entity in the middle checking your information. Because here, in this case, since it's just software, we don't really consider it an entity. It's not, um, we can think of it as almost like brainless and unbiased, it's just some code. So and as we can see in the figure here, this is what our distributed system would look like. So in the case of these five nodes, each of them is connected to the other so through some sort of path. So what basically all of this means is that in distributed systems, there's no middleman. There's no trusted third party and everyone can kind of interact together. It's peer to peer. Secondly, everything that happens in a blockchain system, whether financial or not, like um, fi in financial cases, we can say like you transfer the money to someone else. Um, but even examples such as you on a blockchain based messaging platform, sending a message to someone else, this message or whatever sort of interaction happens between you and another individual, maybe another app that you're using, all of these we can call as transactions. So it's just basically some form of interaction between two entities. And like we can see in this case, we would have uh, in the image here on the side, we'd have two individuals and we can see that they're kind of 
um, directly, uh, di directly interacting. In this case, it's financial, but we can have other examples. And what we, call, we just call this a transaction. So what is a transaction? What does it look like? So a transaction is just basically a collection of data. And what this data exactly is, is it consists of a sender, so the person initiating the transaction, the receiver, so the person being interacted with or the receiving entity in this case, and then the hash date, and then the hashed data. And we'll talk about what hashing is in a second. So with this structure, the data here, like I said, doesn't need to be strictly financial. We just call it transactions because that's kind of um, the general structure. That's how, uh, I guess, the abstraction that um, blockchain implemented in this case. So as of now, we've talked about the nodes. So how kind of these different entities and these different individuals can interact with each other within the network. And then we've also talked about um, kind of what the data that is transferred between them is, in this case, transactions. And like we said, the data that's being sent in this case, or in each transaction, is hashed. So what exactly is hashing? So uh, if any of you have taken ComSci 132 or um, any sort of like data structures class up until now, maybe 465 as well, um, hashing is just basically, you can think of it as another form of cryptography. So, you know, like, uh, let's say on any messaging platform that you use today, most likely, all your uh, data, all your messages, they say are encrypted. Basically, what this means is that they take your data, they input it through some kind of algorithm or some kind of function, which systematically changes this data and uh, makes it appear in another, in another form, like we can see in this case. We took plain text, we put it into a hash function, and it became hash text. It became gibberish. So an individual can't really understand it if they read it. But because the computer is the one that implemented or facilitated this progress, it can understand the data that comes out. So while I compared hashing to cryptography, it's not exactly the same thing. So in cryptography, the function that changes um, your inputted data to gibberish, you could say, is systematic, which basically means that you, this function is going forward, you can kind of reverse the logic and make it go backwards. So you can take this gibberish data, plug it into the reverse of the function, and it will give you the exact same output. However, with hashing, that's not the case. It's only, it's forward only. So whenever you input data um, and it, whatever comes out, you can't change back into its original form. Um, I know most, a lot of you must be thinking then how can we kind of, um, I guess, extract this data later. So we don't really need to know the details, but what generally happens, if any of you are curious, is that the blockchain kind of stores that the plain data that was inputted and kind of implements the function again and compares it to whatever gibberish it had before that was stored in the system. So it takes the original and the output, implements the hash function on the original, and then compares and sees if those are if that uh, previous output and the new output are the same thing. If they are, that means the data hasn't been edited. Does anyone of you have any questions up until here? I know I've kind of went over a bunch of different things. Um, so if any of you have any questions regarding the structure of blockchain, uh, now would kind of be the time to get those questions out. Okay, cool. Well, I'll keep going, but like I said, if you have any questions, just uh, jump in within the Q&A or just kind of uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask me directly. So the last part of the blockchain structure is the blocks themselves. So we kind of talked about how the individuals are uh, connected in a peer-to-peer -peer distributed system. And we saw how the transactions look like within the system. So the blockchain itself, which contains just the data, is kind of implemented in a linear structure. So like you can see in this image, what we have is we have d these different blocks and each one of them contains a set of transactions. So not only one, but it can contain up like more than 500, one, uh, 1,000, like I forgot the exact number, um, or there are different numbers within different blockchain implementations, um, but okay, for some reason the chat does not seem to be opening, or the Q&A doesn't seem to be opening, I'm sorry. 
Okay. If you're Whereas having an issue with your chat, there's a... Hey, okay, can yeah, you sorry, hear me? I think I got it. Yeah, I can. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, sometimes the chat gets stuck behind the screen that you're presenting. Um, were you able to pull up the Q&A? I think that uh, can yeah, occur it was. as well. Awesome. Okay. Yes, thank you. Why aren't there any other companies that use blockchain, use the same currency as Bitcoin? Um, so, like, why isn't Bitcoin kind of used in different companies? Is that your specific question? If I understood it correctly. Um, so, while we will talk about kind of industry example, like implementations of blockchain, uh, lots of companies kind of, okay, first of all, Bitcoin is still kind of in its early stages. I know it's been around for a couple of years, but um, it's still like a bunch of different companies aren't kind of completely ready to take it on as a um, kind of sort of like financial um, substitute, you could say. So while there are like kind of different cryptocurrencies, it's just kind of the industry, I guess, right now. Like, I, I'm sorry, I don't have like a really specific, um, really pleasing answer to this question, but it's just that uh, the industry's acceptance of blockchain technology is kind of now starting to grow, but it's still a little bit slow. So while there are a bunch of different um, applications, uh, companies, and et cetera, that use blockchain technology, and they more specifically use Bitcoin as a financial substitute for normal fiat currencies. Um, a lot of them still don't wanna change the entire method which they do things and kind of change their structure and et cetera um, because they still feel that the current, that the technology is relatively new. That's kind of the best answer I can give you right now because um, it's a question that's also big in the industry right now and it's kind of just taken on a company to company basis. Uh, okay, in a single transaction between, say, two people, do the blocks in the chain contain data from other transactions, or is it a completely separate entity? Okay, so um, to your question, Joseph, each block, as you can see in the image here, contains more than one transaction. So just based on the time that the block is added to the entire chain, because that's not instant, like the whenever blocks are added to the chain, it, that doesn't happen instantaneously. So based on the, the time um, from when the old block is added to when the new block is added, any transactions that occur between that, within that time frame are added to the new block. Um, and then you had a separate question, if there is another uh, unrelated data in a transaction. Yeah, uh, I think I've answered your question. Yeah, so basically just um, de depending on the time between when blocks are added, any transactions that occur within the time frame within that time span are immediately um, inputted into the new block. And as you can see, there are also hat like we talked about that the transaction data is hashed, but also all the data. So um, the block number, all of the transactions that are within it are also taken as input to a hash function and then hashed. And then basically um, every single new block that's added, it has a hash. It, it, points to the hash of the previous block. So it points to the hash of the block that was added before it, which gives it a linear linked list structure. Any of you have heard of that? Okay, and someone asked a question within the chat as well. So are blocks linked based on an activity? I mean, like deposits in your account or withdrawals in your account or are all irrelevant blocks? So um, Siva, to answer your question, Blocks aren't kind of distributed based on what the activities are. Um, once you have kind of a blockchain implementation on uh, whatever kind of example that you have, every single, like every block that's added can contain transactions of any single type. So like I said, transactions don't just have to be strictly financial, they can be anything. And because they're anything, you can't really have a distinction between them, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Uh, yes. Okay, so yeah, like I said, just the last point of uh, the block the blockchain structure is that the nodes or the individuals are in a distributed format, and then the blocks are in a linear format, and each block can contain multiple different transactions. Okay, great. I'm really happy that we're having a bunch of different questions. Um, okay. 
now uh, we're kind of gonna fast forward, let's say a couple years after blockchain's implementation. Okay, so we have another question. Now we can have transactions, then we still need an application to summarize in those transactions like a ledger. So um, a blockchain in and of itself Siva, is considered a distributed ledger. So this block structure is a ledger in of itself. It's the data storage that we have. So the data is stored in blocks and then those blocks are stored linearly. If that makes sense. So you don't need like a specific other application to present those transactions. Um, in the bare blockchain implementation, that data storage is a ledger in and of itself. Great. Okay. I hope I hope I answered your question. Okay. So like I said, we're kind of going to fast forward a couple years um, after the implementation of Bitcoin and kind of the introduction of blockchain technology as a whole. So a couple years after um, Bitcoin, or as you can see from kind of the topics that we talked about, if we take just Bitcoin implementation, all it does is its transactions are strictly financial. So you can't really do anything with the blockchain structure that Bitcoin introduced, except transferring finances or transferring Bitcoin in this case. So while we said here in the transactions that it can be anything, any other type of data, within um, Bitcoin's implementation, it was only financial. So then the question is, how can blockchain be used in other areas? Um, how, like you said, like I said before, um, it can be used in uh, social media platforms and things like that. And I said that the data doesn't have to be financial. So how does that happen? Well, this happens with the introduction of something called a smart contract. So what we're gonna be talking about now is kind of how blockchain can be used in various different uh, situations, you could say. So Ethereum is kind of, so Bitcoin was considered, can be considered blockchain 1.0 or kind of the first iteration of blockchain technology, as I've said many times before. And while Ethereum was kind of the next step in blockchain, um, it was considered, it, the difference was so uh, major that it was considered blockchain 2.0. So what Ethereum did is it, it's in and of itself, it's a blockchain uh, platform, just like uh, Bitcoin. But what Ethereum did is it introduced some things called smart contracts. And what smart contracts are, are basically just lines of code, which have a set of um, clauses or conditions that need to be satisfied in order for this code to run. So let's say you want to rent an apartment from someone. So you and the landlord are kind of communicating. And in the end, he says, okay, I need uh, this down payment. And uh, based on me, and whenever I receive this down payment, I'll give you, let's say the key code to the complex. So in this case, in order to kind of, for each individual to kind of ensure that they get what they are, that they get what they need. So like the individual, he wants the key code to the um, complex and then the landlord wants the uh, down payment. So what happens here is within a smart contract, it would, someone could write it and it could say, okay, so upon receiving, so upon the landlord, uh, so what happened? Okay, let's take a step back. So the smart contract would basically take in the code from the landlord and then it would take in the down payment from the individual. And this exchange, like the, each of these two things won't, wouldn't be given to the other person until they've both been received, until those bo two conditions, receiving the key code and receiving the finances are um, fully completed or they're checked, you could think of it as a checklist. So with this kind of general structure, blockchain becomes that much more powerful. So you could write a smart contract for virtually anything. And all it has to be is just the conditions that need to um, take place in order for a transaction to occur. And then whenever those conditions are satisfied, that's when the transaction happens or that's when the transaction is completed. So this way you can kind of um, guarantee that everyone gets um, what they need and that and it also adds like another layer of uh, complexity, you could say, to blockchain implementations. So 
this means that like within any two individuals, now we just have strict code. And this code isn't like Bitcoin, it's not strictly financial and it's not biased. Um, so like it can't be like an entity kind of uh, giving you different conditions or different um, or kind of different requirements based on what the transaction is or anything like that. It's just a set of code and it's like, okay, are these uh, things completed? Yes or no, implement it. So here we can think of the middleman, although I really urge you to not use that term while talking about blockchain. Um, but we can just for uh, kind of theoretical sake, we can consider that this middleman now is the code that is implemented within the smart contract, if that makes sense. And this is a really important concept. So if you have any questions about this, um, please kind of feel free to just jump in right now and ask. But yeah, so smart contracts is what makes blockchain powerful today. If it was just the Bitcoin implementation, of course, that would be really nice. And it has a lot, of, a bunch of different positives. Um, but at the same time, it's not that powerful. It can't be used anywhere else. Whereas smart contracts kind of break the traditional blockchain mold and um, allow it to be used in any different industries. And, we, and we're going to talk about that. So all, okay, so, so all transactions between entities can be considered as a smart contract or smart contract is a comp Okay, it's, um, so smart contract, like you said in your second point, smart contracts are comparable to normal contracts in day-to-day -day life. So every single smart contract is implemented just as um, a normal contract would be in real life. So like the one I, like the example I gave for um, kind of uh, the uh, leasing, uh, like I said, like the key code with the landlord and all of that, you could write one smart contract and then any individual who comes to rent within that apartment complex, the same smart contract would run. It's just that the data being inputted each time is different, different key codes, different uh, users, et cetera, if that makes sense. So you wouldn't have multiple smart contracts, you'd have multiple transactions for that smart contract. Okay, Joseph, so who writes a smart contract and can they be used slash read by people that don't know any code? That is a really great question. So smart contracts are basically implemented by whoever is making the application. So in this case, um, I guess I didn't really explain it properly, but Ethereum is an entire blockchain in and of itself. And on Ethereum, there are multiple different applications that have been created using the Ethereum blockchain. So using the nodes that Ethereum has, like the different entities, um, using the hash types that uh, uh, Ethereum implements and kind of all of that is just, so all of those different properties can be used by developers who create smart contracts. So after the session, you today could go write a smart contract, just a smart contract on its own. You don't need to handle um, the block structure. You don't need to handle the nodes. You don't need to handle any of that. You, all you need to do is write the smart contract, put it on Ethereum, and then boom, people can immediately start using it. Now, the second part of your question is, can be, they be used slash read by people that don't know code? That is kind of a 50-50, you could say. So um, I guess within the Ethereum community in and of itself, individuals that use Ethereum are people who are passionate about blockchain, which means they kind of like the different positives that blockchain brings, and they kind of follow its rules, you could say. So anyone who creates a smart contract would uh, try to kind of write a really good description um, or a really good documentation, you could say, of whatever the smart, con of the, whatever the smart contracts um, uh, conditions are and kind of how it works. But if you wanna be even more sure on any individual smart contract that's within Ethereum, so even if it's um, a smart contract for an application that someone made, you, as an individual, whether you know code or not, you can open up that smart contract and read it for yourself. So it's all public, everything is public. And that's kind of one of the beauties of blockchain technology. Everything is open source, everything is public. You can go in, you can read the smart contract and you can be 100% sure that whatever the person is explaining in their documentation is exactly what occurs in the contract. Of course, if someone doesn't know code, they wouldn't be able to kind of um, check that aspect or check the code aspect of that but I guess that's just something that is more of a societal issue 
um, and an individual like kind of case by case basis um, rather than an entire like blockchain issue, you could say. But I really like the question. Okay, so if no one has any other questions about uh, smart contracts or, um, wait, was it? Okay, do smart, Seva, do smart contracts have hashes? If yes, I mean, so I'm okay, smart contracts. Okay, so uh, does, okay, so do smart contracts have hashes? If yes, I mean, so I'm okay, the smart contract. Okay, so let's say, let's take the same example that you made an application on Ethereum. So, so what would happen is within this application, any transactions that occur, the hash of them and the, the transaction itself is stored on the Ethereum blockchain. So ever since Ethereum was introduced in I think 2000, between 2010 and 2012, I forget the exact date, but ever since Ethereum was introduced up until now, um, the blockchain has for the most part remained the same. I say for the most part, because there was this um, thing that happened, but we don't need to worry about that, but kind of the, the blockchain stayed the same. So any transactions that occurred from any of the um, initial applications that were on Ethereum and also the applications that were created, let's say even yesterday, all of the hashes of that are stored on the main Ethereum blockchain. And the Ethereum blockchain is also public, same as the Bitcoin one. Like you could go in and kind of look at um, the blockchain data. Of course, you wouldn't be able to understand the data because it's hashed and you wouldn't be able to know who made what data since they kind of have these um, you could say hash keys for each individual, which you can kind of think of it as just some person's ID. And you can never, and you can't tie that ID to an individual just by reading it. And uh, you also said you wanted to understand how hash transactions um, that happened a while ago are retrieved. So like I said, what happens is the blockchain itself um, kind of privately stores the data that's being sent. So Oh, individuals can't really see it, but you can kind of think of it as it has um, access to kind of a pure form of the data. And then what happens is, let's say, I want to check if the $20 I sent someone um, three days ago or 10 days ago um, were completely received, right? So, or I want to check if it was actually $10. So what happened is, um, the blockchain in and of itself, the software would kind of look at me, the person who sent the data, the person who received it and whatever that data was, take those three things, put it into the hash function, and then it would compare this new hash that it created just now with the hash stored for that transaction that occurred 10 days ago. And it would compare the hashes. If they're the same, that means that the data that the, it put into the hash function is the data that was stored. And if they're different, then that means it either changed or it's not the same thing. Okay, another question. How does the blockchain identify you? So what happens is whenever you kind of want to interact with a blockchain, there's this thing called a uh, key for each individual. So with this, so each individual kind of gets assigned two things, something called a private key and something called a public key. So a private key is like basically your fingerprint on the blockchain. If you lose your private key, anyone can become you. But there's also something called the public key. The public key is kind of, it, it's public. You can kind of give that to your friends if they wanna transfer you some money or if you wanna kind of interact with them on the blockchain in any way. And kind of those two things are considered your blockchain IDs. Whereas if someone steals your private key, then yes, they can say that they're you and no one would really be able to tell. But um, if they just stole your public key, then it can kind of be identified that they're not really you. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of move on since I see that we're, we only have 20 minutes. So I wanna kind of get through the rest of the content I have and then I can open the floor up and we can go through questions. Okay, so blockchain in different industries. Um, like I said, because of smart contracts, blockchain can be implemented virtually anywhere. So let's just take some examples. Like this game, it's called CryptoKitties. Um, I have a friend who uh, is really into this game, but basically this game kind of uses blockchain technology. And the idea of it is you kind of um, have these little virtual kittens and you can kind of take care of them. 
um, you can play with them, etc. And then based on how much you take care of these virtual kittens, their value increases and people kind of buy it off you for real money, um, which is really interesting. And kind of the cool thing about this is that because they used um, like the hashing properties of blockchain, every single kitten is unique. And that's because every single hash, um, which I forgot to mention before, is unique based on the data that's inputted. So let's say you take in the hash, you take in the words hello, you input it into a hash function. Every single time you input this word hello into the same hash function, the output will be exactly the same. But let's say you changed the H to an I and you inputted that, then the outputted hash would be completely different. And those and that outputted hash would be unique. So you cannot get that same output unless you input hello, but with the H as an I. And so they kind of use this property and make every single kitten represented by a hash. So every single kitten is unique. And that's kind of a game implementation uh, of blockchain that you wouldn't really think of. Uh, but it is beneficial. We can talk about other um, benefits the game gets from blockchain, but uh, that's kind of for another time. Um, there's also this application called EtherTweet. And it's kind of, like the name says, an Ethereum version of Twitter. Um, and kind of the main thing here is that there's no one managing any of the tweets that are being sent out. Um, it's only like code. So what happens is this means that there's no censorship. So there's no entity that's like, oh man, like you can't say that or you can't post this or et cetera. So it's kind of completely transparent. But at the same time, it's also anonymous since no one knows, since your identity is just related to your keys, no one knows who you really are. So, um, which is something really cool. And that's just another implementation. We, and of course there are a bunch of societal concerns with this, but we're not gonna talk about that now. This is just an example. Um, finally, uh, since I don't think we'll have time for the practical example today, but I kind of want to introduce like blockchain at PSU and allow you to kind of uh, get to know us, what we do and how you can get involved. So what we do at blockchain at PSU is we're kind of interested in uh, teaching students on campus, uh, fundamental blockchain skills, um, whether theoretical or technical, whichever you decide, and kind of allowing students to get a head start in that space, while also um, potentially like leading uh, or working on blockchain project with a bunch of different companies. Like we have, we're backed by uh, IBM, Block Venture, Coalition, NEO, and multiple different others. So our two main things is that we provide semester long theoretical workshops on blockchain. So uh, every single week on Sunday, I believe, we have a uh, workshop based on a theoretical blockchain concept. So we'll just talk about the theory aspect of it. Um, and like, we'll go through different examples of um, blockchain and in industries. Um, we'll go through kind of concerns of blockchain with societal and blockchain implementation with society and kind of the clashes there. And we also have these DIY projects um, where we kind of, that we created on our own and basically they're a self-paced um, self project that you can do on your own. We give you the instructions, we give you the tools. So you can kind of play around with that. And by following that guide, you can kind of um, make a bunch of these different uh, blockchain projects. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, two things I also forgot to put on the slide is that one, uh, next semester we do have a blockchain course a one credit blockchain course that is four credit um, every single Sunday, I believe, uh, was the scheduling date. Um, once a week, it's one credit, and we're kind of gonna go deep into the technical aspects of uh, blockchain. It's called Blockchain Deep Dive, and I'll personally be leading that course, so if any of you wanna check it out, since I know lots of people are scheduling uh, this week. And we also plan on, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's the other two points that I wanted to mention. So uh, I guess I'm done with my presentation now. So if any of you have any lingering questions um, about blockchain that we didn't get to get to, now would be the time. Yeah, you guys still have till five o'clock. So feel free to use the Q&A in the chat to ask him any questions you've got about his presentation. It was really good, by the way. I liked it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat>
Okay, Seva. So our public and private keys part of a hash. So they're the output of a hash. Um, so like I said, whenever you kind of want to um, get started implementing a block or get started working or using a blockchain, you're assigned a public and a private key. And those are just basically a hash of different data. So um, in more technical terms, the data that's included in that hash is uh, the timestamp of uh, when you kind of uh, open, when you kind of started this blockchain identity um, and what kind of computer you use or um, what kind of blockchain you're on, et cetera. So all of that is kind of and a bunch of different information is kind of put together as like a string or as like a, like some text and put it into a hash function. And then it kind of um, produces these two uh, keys. So a public and a private key. And there's more detail about like the mathematical implementation of that. So there's something called um, SHA-256 and um, ECDSA, if you wanna read more about that. And that's just basically um, a mathematical function that they use to create public and private keys, if that makes sense. Thoughts on a, okay. Yes, links, Siva, uh, sorry, I forgot about that. I will be pasting. So I pasted three links in the chat. So basically what these are is, the first one is to kind of join the blockchain at PSU organization. Um, the second one is if you kind of want to apply to be a team member. So be part of a team that makes these workshops um, that uh, kind of talks to companies that uh, et cetera and all the things like the different things that we do. And then the third thing, oh, me to panel, sorry. I will post that again. Okay, there you go. So the first is just to join the organization. The second is to um, submit an application to become a team member and we're on a rolling admission basis. Um, so whenever you feel like uh, you wanna join, just please feel free to uh, shoot us an application. And the third one is to kind of join our Slack channel where uh, me and a bunch of other team members will be there and you can kind of uh, ask any lingering uh, questions that you have about blockchain, any random blockchain questions. Um, we try to um, kind of raise issues and raise topics about blockchain that we can kind of talk about um, together and kind of answer people's questions. It's a really nice community. And there were a bunch of other questions. So thoughts on a blockchain voting system, would it work and how would it work? Um, that's a really interesting question. So, and uh, there are a bunch of like different websites, blogs, and I think people working on different implementations to kind of try to um, implement a blockchain voting system. So personally, I think it would work. Uh, to some extent. So within a voting system, so within a blockchain voting system, kind of let's say the pot, let's take a look at the positives first. So number one is that people are anonymous um, and there's a downside to that, which we'll talk about, but you can kind of don't feel pressured to uh, vote any specific way. And whatever your vote was can't be directly traced back to you, um, which, is a, which is something really nice. And at the same time, since um, the thing kind of like counting the votes and out and keeping track of all of that is software. Um, that would mean that no one can kind of uh, falsify votes. No one can tamper information due to the uh, specifics of how blockchain is implemented. You can't tamper with any information that was inputted. So kind of all of that information or any of the information that was inputted by a voter would be in its pure form, which would be uh, something really positive. However, the downside is kind of making sure that all of the entities that you have or all of the people who are voting are actually people eligible to vote. Whether this is something like the presidential elections with which just finished uh, or something kind of on a smaller scale, like even within a club or within a different organization, that's something you kind of have to manage. But there is a solution to that and it's called a private or permissioned blockchain, which um, I honestly did not have time, did not think I'd have time to talk about today, um, but you could kind of read more about permissioned and private blockchains. But basically what that is, is that within those blockchain implementations, you have the same, all the same benefits, except that all the users that are input that are on the blockchain are known. So you can go back and you can find out who those people are, uh, which is not 50-50, you could say. But yeah, I, overall, I think it would work. 
Okay, Joseph. So what about mining Bitcoin? What is that about? And I would love to see a practical example. Okay. Uh, so about mining Bitcoin, basically what that is, is so we said that, um, I can go back here, that blocks aren't added instantaneously. So what I meant by that is in order to add a block into um, whatever implementation that you have, there has to be something that needs to be completed. So in the case of Bitcoin, what happens is a process called mining, like you said. And what mining is, is that the hashes of the transactions, um, like, okay, let's look at an individual block. So within this block, like we said, there are transactions and there's like some general block data, like what the number, like the number of that block, um, when it was added, etc. So what happens in mining is that all of this data is kind of hashed together. So it's taken as just one giant piece of text. It's hashed and then it, it's taken as one giant piece of text and a small number is added to that text as a string and then all of that is hashed. And then what happens is what miners do is they basically have that final output hash and they have all of the block data. What they're missing is that one number that was included. So what they all try to do is they try to solve this mathematical function, you could say, which is trying different numbers with the data and then comparing the hashes. And that's kind of considered the process of mining. So the block is only added whenever one person solves that or is able to kind of uh, solve for that number. And if they do, the block is added. The person who solved it gets a Bitcoin reward, if we're talking about in the case of Bitcoin. Um, and also the benefit of this is to kind of entice individuals or incentivize uh, people on the network to mine. And what mining kind of is, is it's also a process of making sure that all the transactions are legit. So in order to have these people make sure that transactions are legit, you have to make them perform some sort of task. And they perform this task, they make sure the transactions are legit. If they are, it's done, block is added. So yeah, mining is kind of um, complex. I know it, like, I didn't wanna kind of uh, go too long or too um, super detailed on that explanation, but that's kind of um, a general overview of what it's about and you can read more about it. But the general idea is that mining Bitcoin is just making uh, sure of the transactions that are gonna be added in a block and also um, the, the whoever added that block gets getting some reward. And that's also called proof of work, if you wanna read about that. Um, in terms of the practical example, Joseph, what I was just gonna show is kind of um, a glimpse into one of the DIY projects that we have. And uh, we do have like five minutes left, so I guess I can do that. Uh, so one second. So this is an example of one of the DIY projects that we have. Oops. So basically what the idea is, is here that you have a bunch of different um, uh, JavaScript files and JavaScript is kind of really popular in uh, blockchain implementation. And what you're supposed to do is uh, on top of each function here that you have, it kind of tells you what that function needs to do. So like, let's say this function, it takes a public key, a message, and then the signature or which is kind of like the hash and then returns if this is valid or not. And kind of, you can go through this. There's a bunch of documentation that we have to help you with this. And if you run NPM test. So what you can see here is it kind of gives you um, output based on the test that you failed. So like here it says, okay, within the file signing module, which is basically the signing.js file in the function create private key, these are the two things you should have done and you didn't do any of them. So you kind of have to do that. And if you scroll down, there's a more detailed error message about that, which says it expected that you should return a hex string and you return something else. So um, for this, we kind of um, have a blockchain at PSU GitHub, which you can check. And here we are gonna be like inputting our um, DIY projects. And within our Slack, uh, which I can show really quickly.
So yeah, so within here, like let's say DIY project, blockchain, that's the example that I showed. And you can kind of see that we're, we have an explanation and we're almost done with it. Um, so within this explanation, you can kind of see the overview of kind of how to start this, uh, the resources to um, look at to kind of understand the implementation and then links to our email or Slack or website and some explanation, which I hope would be beneficial. And I believe someone was asking something else as well within the Q&A. So I have a PSU domain email. Uh, it's okay, even with the PSU domain email, you can still uh, sign up to our Slack. Just if you follow the link that we sent, um, it'll you can get prompted to um, create a Slack account. And then from there, you can join our, our Slack workspace. And I can quickly uh, show you what it looks like here. So let's go to announcements. So here, like you can see, um, Justin, he's the person in charge. He's our education chair. And he's in charge of the weekly workshops. So like here, he shares the slides, um, he shares recordings of them, and this has been happening since the beginning of the semester. Okay, so any other questions? I know we only have three minutes left, but it won't let you sign up. Oh, you don't have a PSU domain email. Um, I can try to look into that. Maybe um, the settings of the workspace are somehow edited, but um, uh, I can check that for you. And if you're still experiencing problems, I'll input the organization email in the chat and you can kind of uh, send us any concerns there. I'll try to change it immediately after this workshop. Um, but if I don't get to that or if something happens, you can email me at this email. Um, and I will uh, sort through that problem for you. Again, um, I hope you guys have a really fun hackathon. I know I enjoy it all the time, even if we're remote. And please uh, think seriously about joining Blockchain at PSU if you're kind of interested in anything that I talked about today. Um, apply, uh, our team is really small right now, so we do need a bunch more people to kind of do everything that we wanna do. But other than that, I hope this has been interesting for you. And I hope I've been able to kind of clear up any doubts or confusions that you have about this topic. Thank you so much for joining us, Abdul Aziz. That was great. And no great problem. job everyone Thank with you. the questions. Everyone did very great. Um, if no one has any more questions, I could go ahead and end the meeting so you guys could hop on to your next webinar. But we'll see you guys then. Thank you again. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.